Now, General Atlantic is a growth equity firm founded in the United States in 1980. In this session, we speak to four of General Atlantic's leaders to understand their investment thesis and what attracts them to Southeast Asia. Moderating the panel will be Ying Lan Tan, founding, partner, founding managing partner of Insignia Ventures Partners. Joining him from the General Atlantic team are Sandeep Naik, Managing Director, Head of India and Southeast Asia, Iskanda Bloy, Vice President, Ashish Sabu, Managing Director and Head of Indonesia, and Roger Gao, Principal. To pose questions to the panel, click on the yellow button beneath the session window. So let's move over to Ying Lan Tan and the General Atlantic Executive Team for more insights into the firm's operations in the region. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is my second panel for today and the last one, uh, and they saved the best for last. Uh, today, we have with us the esteemed team uh, from General Atlantic. I would say they are the emperors of uh, global growth investing. A few of them are my personal friends as well, so it's a really privilege for me to be here moderating the session. Um, and I wanted to sort of give a context of uh, you know, how, how I've interacted with uh, General Atlantic before uh, you know, um, letting Sandeep uh, give an overview. So I, I think the best, me fondest memory I had uh, of uh, my interaction with General Atlantic was my breakfast meeting with uh, the CEO, Bill Ford. Uh, well, this was in February this year. And he spent uh, about 30 minutes talking to me about culture and firm building. And I was very uh, impressed by the ethos uh, of how General Atlantic has been built and the world-class uh, infrastructure and the people they have attracted in, in, into the firm. Um, so I think without further ado, I think I would love to uh, invite um, uh, Sandeep to give a quick overview uh, of the firm and I can go into many interesting questions that we have. Um, Sandeep, over to you. Thank you, Inglang, and we couldn't have a better, better person moderating this discussion than you given we go back over a decade and you've seen yes. the whole journey very closely. So thank you so much for the opportunity and we're very glad uh, to give you a behind the scenes look at General Atlantic. Uh, I believe that General Atlantic is an exceptionally special story uh, because of our foundation and where we come from. You know, uh, Chuck Feeney, who gave us uh, the capital to start General Atlantic, uh, basically was the only source of capital. So we were a single family office for a very, very long time. And Chuck Feeney's reason to start General Atlantic was he said that he was an entrepreneur. He was somebody who founded the duty-free shops all around the world. And he wanted General Atlantic to become global and go back entrepreneurs all around the world. Because being an entrepreneur, being a CEO, being a founder sometimes becomes a lonely journey. And you need somebody that you can brainstorm, you can bounce things off. And so the foundation of General Atlantic is we always consider ourselves as great partners to entrepreneurs. And that continues to be the first and the only thing that we focus on. If you do that right, everything else follows. So fast forward from where Chuck started and us being a single family office. Today, we are a global growth equity firm that is firmly focused on what Chuck wanted us to focus, which is empowering companies and founders to reach new levels of growth at scale. So that, that's how I would define what we at General Atlantic do. And we continue to be a single fund focused on global growth equity. And that's again is very special for us at GA. So if you think about us, it's just a single pool of capital that is trying to find the best entrepreneurs all over the world. So if there is a deal in China that our New York partner thinks he can add to, or if there's a deal in Mexico that I can uh, participate and add something to, we will take the next flight out there because all of us work for the single pool of capital and our incentives are tied to a single pool of capital. So we can truly deliver the best of the firm to wherever the deal is because of the strong alignment that we have. We have about 40 billion of assets under management, around 130 portfolio companies worldwide. Uh, roughly 70% of them are in tech and financial services. So we, are, uh, we, have, a, we have an edge in tech and financial services. More than 50% of the portfolio is outside of the US with one third of that in emerging markets. So when we say we are truly global, we indeed are. And Asia is a huge focus area for us as we see more and more global entrepreneurs coming out of Asia. In 80% of the portfolio are minority positions. So majority of our deals are minority. And I'd like to emphasize that because we haven't moved away from our foundational theory that we will be great partners to our entrepreneurs. 
You know, we have 14 global offices across five regions, and uh, we have come a very long way. We are celebrating our 40th year this year. And so we have learned lots of lessons, Ying Lang, around the way and around the globe as well, having done this now for 40 years. No, fa fantastic. Uh, that's a great intro. I wanted to uh, shift gears uh, to uh, China uh, and the great work that Roger has, has done as well. Uh, and I think Sandeep uh, outlined it very well that there's the global synergy uh, um, and one pool of fun. And I think there's a lot of cross learnings uh, between geographies that the firm benefits from. Uh, Roger, you, can you talk a little bit about uh, what's going on in China for General Atlantic and some of the great investments you have made, like Bike Dance? Yeah, sure. Happy to. So, so this is the 40, uh, 40, uh, 40th year anniversary of GA, and now this is the 20 year anniversary of GA China. So, I think like we entered the region like 20 years ago, initially with a strategic focus on uh, technology investment and consumer investment. And now we are expanding our coverage to uh, financial services, fintech, and healthcare. And uh, we, we look at like the investment opportunity by generations, you know, and we are very fortunate to have the luxury to work with the leading entrepreneurs and the business in each different like uh, technology eras. So for example, you know, like uh, we, are the, we are one of the investors in Alibaba, you know, back in 2000, 2007, and uh, uh, in the PC era, and then in the mobile era, uh, we are very fortunate to be the leading investors uh, in so-called ADM, uh, namely and financial uh, total, which is better now, and also Meituan. You know, we we are also investors in in uh, each different like a vertical leaders such as 58.com, that is music, Shimalaya, Futu, and the Dingdong, etc. And now you know, like uh, looking forward, you know, we are we are all geared up and committed to ready and ready to support the next generation entrepreneurs and the business in the region. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Roger, for giving a, a quick overview. Uh, then let's shift gears to uh, Southeast Asia. And uh, Ashish, uh, uh, I'd love for Ashish to share a little bit about uh, the plans for Southeast Asia. I uh, understand from Sandeep that uh, GA just opened an office in Jakarta. And, and Ashish, you are spearheading the efforts uh, and looking to expand uh, activity and the footprint uh, in Southeast Asia. Ashish, you want to talk a little bit about what's happening in Indonesia and Southeast Asia as a, as a whole? Uh, we opened our office in Indonesia two years back now. It's almost celebrating second anniversary today, like this month. So uh, it has been two years and it has been a very good journey. And the plan was, as in line with what we have done in other geographies, have good, strong local teams on the ground to realize the potential uh, and get the cover from the global. So in Indonesia, as you know, today it's experiencing very good growth. In terms of technology, Indonesia has been leading, whether it be uh, there has been very fast eruption of technology. People right from the Facebook to Instagram times and now in ride hailing and OTA, uh, Indonesia has been in terms of penetration comparable to China. Uh, also in e-commerce, uh, it has been above some of its BRIC countries in terms of penetration, etc. So the opportunities which are emerging in Indonesia are huge. And uh, it is for that reason we opened the office. And today, if I see where the opportunities could be, if you were to ask, uh, I would say it would be in all the sectors, uh, uh, whether it be education tech is something which we invested last year in Ruang Guru, but there are also opportunities in FinTech, health tech, etc. So the the opportunity space is quite big. Oh, fantastic. Uh, one of the key tenets of a great firm and a juggernaut is uh, sort of a, uh, grooming the next generation. And today we have uh, Iskandar here as well. Uh, <laughs> I, I wanted to also get a sense from sort of the perspective from a relatively younger investor in the team. Uh, how do you see you know, uh, sort of your, your, yourself growing uh, at a firm like GA, uh, Iskandar? And what do you, what do you like uh, especially about uh, investing at GA? Yeah, I think there's, you know, there's really two things which, um, which stand out. And, and it was something that we were talking about yesterday. I think one is, you know, GA is an intensely curious firm. And I, and I think you see that in, in the sectors that we go into. Uh, and you see that in the geographies that we commit to. And so you're always on the cusp of, what, of what's new in the world, be it technologically or from a market standpoint. Um, and so I think that, that creates a lot of opportunity for learning uh, for someone at my tenure in investing. I think the second is um, there is a very good commitment to transparency and to decision-making within the firm. So as a junior member of the firm, I get exposed to not just 
how or, or what we're seeing in, in other parts of the world, but how different investors at the senior level of our firm think about deals. And I think the combination of, of the opportunity to look at very many opportunities and improve decision quality, I think, is, is a hallmark of the firm, which is something that we're committed to. And it's something that I, you know, I would say that I've benefited to or, or hope to have benefited to uh, from in, in a short span of time. No, oh, great. Th thanks for sharing that. I think that's a, that's a very important attribute uh, of, you know, of great firms. Uh, and certainly firms like Insignia can learn a lot from, uh, from, from what you do at GA. Uh, I want to go back to Sandeep. Uh, and uh, you know, given Sandeep spent a lot of time in India, he's the, really the uh, you know de facto expert on growth investing in, in India. And uh, he just wrote a, a you know I guess uh, your team just wrote a check, big very large check in Joe. Uh, and uh, this this check size is probably the size of uh, that's larger than most venture firms out there. <laughs> so uh, I love for you to you know to the extent you can disclose, uh, share a little bit about the thesis and some of the rationale and some of the you know sort of macro landscape you see and in India and how you shape up in the next few years. Yeah. So um, you know if you think about globally, what is the key secular trend that we are following? You know, the, we see three secular trends that's driving the transformation globally. One is the transition to the digital economy. So technology adoption continues to accelerate as data is driving the next decade of disruption, right? So that's number one. Number two, there's globalization of innovation and entrepreneurship. There's no longer innovation that's open, only happening on the West Coast in the US, but that truly is getting globalized by some global innovation hubs being created with a place even like Singapore and what we are trying to do here with the biotech or places like China where life sciences has taken off in a big way outside of the tech innovation that's happened in the country. And the last and the most important thing for our audience here is the shift of economic growth to emerging markets led by Asia. We are going to drive the incremental GDP of the world in the next 20 years. So that is a big trend for us not to forget and make sure that we can go out and support the entrepreneurs there. Coming back to the GEO deal in India, we wrote the largest check that General Atlantic has ever written in its history in India. So that shows our commitment to emerging markets. We wrote $875 million in a single deal at, 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 at one go. And that was, uh, that was the commitment that we are showing towards Reliance Geo. If you think about Reliance Geo, they are the number one telecom player in India today, having started just three years ago. So they were the last entrant into the telecom market. There were already 12 players in that market before them. But they said, we don't want to build a telco company. We want to come and build the digital society of India with connectivity being the foundation. So before Geo happened in September 2017, when they launched, data cost in India was one of the highest in the world. The engagement of people on mobile in India was the lowest in the world. And wireless penetration or smartphone penetration was nowhere close to where you anticipated. Geo came in with 4G technology. So they didn't have the baggage of the incumbent 3G and 2G. And they came in and said, we will provide the best quality connectivity and we will target what I call Yinglang, the Bharat of India. Bharat is the Indian term for India. Yep. When people talk about India, people focus on the metro consumers, the 40 to 60 million consumers. But the real TAM or the addressable market is the tier two, tier three India, which is the biggest uh, TAM for India, which is over a billion consumers. So Reliance came and said, we want to reach every Indian and we want to put a smartphone in the hands of every Indian at data cost, which is going to be the lowest in the world. And with that today, India is the highest consumer of data in the world. Okay. So it was a phenomenal shift in the way India leapfrogged the digital landscape because of Geo. So when we looked at Geo, and we have had an existing relationship with the family for over a decade, when we looked at Geo, we said the biggest issue with consumer tech companies in India that tried to do the cut, copy, paste model of, of what worked in the US or what worked in China and thought that it would work in India, where billions of dollars got poured behind those companies, but, but none of them scaled up to profitability. The biggest reason was the customer acquisition cost. You have to keep throwing subsidies, you have to keep throwing discounts to get these customers. And the customers are not loyal because in emerging markets, customers chase value, not necessarily only convenience. And because of the CAC, a lot of these companies at the unit economic level were very unprofitable. 
when Jio came in and Jio said, we, now that we have 400 million subscribers on our platform, if we can build the digital ecosystem and start providing products and services to our captive customer base, they could do it at absolutely zero CAC. And that changes the unit economics of the entire business, which is why it is a very, very important play in India. And we wrote our biggest check because we see this as a 10, 20 year compounder that will continue to grow. And it wasn't just us. You saw that Facebook invested with Geo and Google invested with Geo. So Facebook and Google, probably this is the only company globally where they sit in the same cap structure because the best way right now to play digital India was through Reliance Geo. Mm -hmm. oh, great. I think that's a great analysis, uh, Sandeep. I'll come back to you, Sandeep, on uh, culture areas. But uh, let's, let's shift gears to uh, Ashish and Iskandar. Uh, on Southeast Asia a little bit. Uh, so I think one of the you know traits that I admire a lot is the uh, operating expertise that you you know the attention to detail that you, you put into helping your companies. And I know you have uh, uh, you know uh, uh, very senior partners, including uh, one of my former deans, uh, uh, Frank Brown, uh, who is uh, helping on the, more on the operating operating side of things. Uh, and I, I understand Ashish, you you, you spend, spend a lot of time helping companies like Run Guru that you invested in. Maybe uh, you and Inskata can share a little bit about that operating uh, expertise that you inject, the DNA that you inject into companies that you partner with. Yeah, England, from my experience over the last two years, I think that is one clear differentiation which uh, General Atlantic brings to the table. Uh, because in this part of the world, uh, you really need to help companies in many areas especially in the hiring area, because the talent is really a shortage. And that's where GA has been making huge differences. Uh, in, we have made, I think we have helped both our portfolio companies in the region, in Indonesia, quite a lot in that aspect. Also, another area which I want to highlight to you, where we have helped both our businesses, uh, is in terms of pricing. So when Ruanguru wants to price its product or whether Starbucks wants to price its coffee, I think we have worked extensively to come out and advise them on these aspects. So these are two areas which I would like to highlight where GA has got a lot of expertise and we have been able to make a difference. It's kind of your Anything I'd add to that yeah. though. Yeah, yeah please. what I'd add to that is, and, and this is the benefit of, I think, of our, of our operating model as a single firm is, I think the expertise that we can bring, uh, one, it's very focused, but two, it's best in class globally. Um, and three, I think, um, you know, it forms the basis of a lot of our, the development of our investment thesis. And so what's been very helpful for me, you know, when I speak to founders in this part of the world is to say, we have a, an expert in pricing or an expert in hiring, and why don't you speak with them um, even before we make an investment? And so I think it's front and center, certainly, of what we do. And I think the ability to call on that expertise as and when we approach investments has been hugely helpful for us as we think about going into investments as well as once we're in them. So it, it, it's a very tight integration, I'd say. Let okay. me just add to that, England. You know, when we did the Reliance Geo deal, obviously a very large check, we wanted to use the global expertise. So it was staffed by the global team. And one of the advisors, we also have a very powerful senior advisor network at GA, exceptionally powerful, which is global CEOs who have now retired to serve as senior advisors to us. So we have Henry, Henry de Castrias, we have uh, Vittorio Kalau. And in, in case of Geo, Vittorio Kalau was the global CEO of Vodafone. And he had, Vodafone was the number one player in India for the longest time. And he had competed with Geo when Geo launched and started taking market share. So I brought in Vittorio as an advisor to our deal because he had the best ringside view of what had happened in the country. And he built our confidence saying that this is a play you should definitely make. So the extended operating partners network and the resources group we have in addition to the very powerful senior advisor group that we have, you always need that gray hair around the table who's been there, done that, to, mm. to, to tell you and, and instill that confidence in you that these are the right bets to take. And we heavily rely on them, no, uh, no. given a single firm approach that we have. No, thank you. Thank, thanks for sharing. I think this is very insightful. Uh, I want to shift gears to Roger a little bit because uh, it's very interesting. We are in an unusual time. Uh, and uh, I think uh, you know, COVID was, you know, was the first to erupt in, in China. And I think, uh, I think what you saw in uh, China, Roger, probably sort of is a, 
It can, it's an early sensing for what has happened to the rest of the jewel. So I wanted to ask you whether you had any uh, sort of uh, cross-firm learnings after, of course, uh, experiencing COVID in China for you know rest of the geographies like India and Southeast Asia. Roger. Uh, Roger, I think you're on mute. But you just have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah. So um, I think like uh, it has been a it has been a very eventful and tough year for us. You know. So as you as you mentioned, you know, like a COVID first uh, uh, breakout in China, and uh, so like uh, we we have a lot of like uh, sharing of our knowledge, um, uh, both on the both on how to uh, deal with the COVID and also how to deal with the investment in, in such like emergency scenarios across the firms. So. I think like so. I you probably read from the news. I think China is quickly back to normal thanks to government like uh, strong uh, uh, step in to control contaminate the virus. So I think like the, uh, what we saw is the economy uh, in China is is already back to normal uh, uh, in May and June, and uh, and we are already seeing like an exporting is back to growth again. So I think our learning from the COVID experience is China. You know, like uh, this is also the learning from a global as well. So at the very beginning of the uh, coronavirus, so I think like uh, we have those special task force set up across the globe to understand what are the investment opportunities in the, uh, given the COVID. And for example, at the very beginning of the year, you know, that by our US team, uh, Indian team and the China team, so we have identified several investment thesis, so which we pull through aggressively across our global team. For example, like uh, online, online entertainment, you know, so as people stay, spend more time at home, so what we saw is uh, the time span and also the traffic in terms of the online entertainment platform exploded uh, in China. For example, as what we saw on Biden's, on, on, on Douyin, on TikTok, overseas, and also on Kuaishou, right? And the other major theme is online education, you know, so, and, uh, and, and unfortunately, we have been leading investor in Baiju's uh, in, 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 in India, so, and which is performing exceptionally well. And the third thesis is online e-commerce, you know, so like, uh, as, uh, as a lot of handicap going offline for shopping, people ship online uh, to, to e-commerce. And specifically in China, we see an explosive growth in grocery categories, you know, which has been underpenetrated uh, by e-commerce uh, uh, historically, but a lot of growth, a lot of like uh, fundraising events uh, in grocery space uh, in China uh, right now. And the fourth one is work from home, you know, like uh, as we saw the great momentum on Zoom, you know, similar trends we saw in China. Uh, I'm sure in India and Southeast Asia as well. So people need like a uh, more enabler, like a uh, softwares to better support like a uh, work from homes uh, as we are all kept, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, indoors uh, by the COVID. And the last thing is online healthcare. I think this is more driven by our US team, you know. So what we saw is we still have the supply side constraints in China, uh, given, you know, the, the, the healthcare supplies is still not 100% market oriented. But we saw a lot of like growth and the momentum, and uh, uh, for example, in the developing markets in the U.S. and in the India. So, so I think like this is how it works. So we are we are a global team, and we share the knowledge globally, and to identify the global thesis and work collaborate to pursue those investment opportunity on a global scale. No, no, thank you, thank you, Roger. Fact, I just want to introduce a very important point about General Atlantic. You know, when people think about COVID and this year and how this year has been a tough year for many people. When we looked at our portfolio and aggregated the growth, uh, average weighted growth across the portfolio, our companies are still growing at 40% plus, even in a COVID year. And the reason for that is an interesting one, which I want to highlight is that we have always been on the forefront of tech disrupting a lot of the, of the, of the, of the verticals that we invest in. And because our portfolio is predominantly uh, leaning much more towards tech investment across our key sectors of consumer, healthcare, financial services. We have benefited even during the COVID period because the adoption curves across these sectors of people leaning on technology to get their products or services has increased. So we have been net beneficiaries in our portfolio companies because of the kind of portfolio that we had created much before COVID hit, right? So all our education technology exposure was taken much before COVID happened. Mm -hmm. Now, COVID just further accelerated the revenue growth and the profitability of those companies, which we hadn't anticipated, but we made those bets with the future in mind saying that this has to move online. This is a sector that hasn't been disrupted and will disrupt, and we are taking a long-term view. But COVID, we became a net beneficiary because those, those companies just took off. 
Oh, fantastic. Actually, I meant to come back to you since, since you are still at the mic. Uh, I wanted to talk about culture. Uh, and, and you're the best person to at least uh, set the landscape, uh, which is, uh, you know, P&L is uh, usually a lagging indicator. Culture is a leading indicator of uh, profits or success. Uh, and, you know, culture is strategy for breakfast. So, um, I want, uh, Santi, I wanted you to maybe shed some light on uh, you know, something that a young firm like, let's say, Insignia can, can uh, learn from a GA. You know, how has GA built such a legendary culture? Uh, and, you, you know, you're the best person to expose on that. Sure. Ying Lang, having, having known you over a decade, you, know, you, you are a great culture carrier yourself, so you don't need any lessons. But I'll tell you, for Jungle Atlantic, culture is not just breakfast, it's breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We take, <laughs> we take a lot of pride in our culture. The reason being that we consistently get picked by the entrepreneurs. And if you look at our deal flow, almost 80 to 85% of our deal flow continues to be proprietary in a very intermediated market, right? So that makes you always pause and say, how can we consistently deliver proprietary deals? And that's because our attitude when we approach entrepreneurs or companies is always that of what can we do to help? There could be a transaction, there could be no transaction, it could just be a conversation where you're just trying to be a curious learner, what Iskander said, and you're just trying to help because you're sitting in a position where you can actually bring a lot of those global resources to bear by just having a half an hour, 45 minute conversation. I'll tell you in my career, uh, you know, almost every deal I have done has been proprietary. And many a times you don't know when you're going to get that call. It is, it is always with an entrepreneur who you have worked for several years, even before the companies of the scale and size of GA. But you're just there because you find it very interesting. Baiju's, I interacted with him four years ago because I found the company super interesting. And when I met Baiju's, I was taken aback by what a phenomenal entrepreneur he is. And we just built a relationship over time. And then he called me one day and said, Sandeep, you have to get General Atlantic into the company now. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm going to raise a big round, but I want GA in before that round. And we did our work. Uh, in, in eight weeks. And because we had followed the company for two years before, it was very easy call to take because you could develop that kind of conviction. And within us doing the deal, within a few weeks of that, he raised a, he raised around a 30% higher price. He didn't have to do that, right? He could have just told me, here's the price, you can come in along with some of the other investors. But what we consistently do, and each of our partners consistently do, is we build honest, trust-based relationship with our entrepreneurs. And that's the focus for the firm. And if a deal happens to come by, great. If not, people still remember you as, as somebody who was there to help them. Because at the end of the day, you know, we are also very humble. We are there to help entrepreneurs build companies. We don't build those companies. And companies don't get built on Excel models. So in the first meeting, if you ask founders for their projections, and I can tell this with a lot of conviction because I was an entrepreneur myself, and I know how that journey is. If, if businesses could be built on Excel spreadsheets, we wouldn't have the kind of entrepreneurs we have today, right? Entrepreneurship is a tough job. There are lots and ups and downs. And as long as you give the entrepreneur the comfort that you will be with them when the time is tough, that is what matters the most to them. It's not the highest price paying investor that usually gets picked. It is somebody that they would like to work with that has capabilities and resources that can help them. And I keep telling our teams, you know, this is a, this is a general Atlantic culture globally. If you are the smartest guy in the room, then leave the room. <laughs> You're not going to learn anything from that conversation. Like, go find a room where you can learn something because only then will you progress. And that's a very integral part of our culture, Ying Lang. And, and as we grow and as we scale, what we at the management committee constantly talk about is how do we not lose out on this part of the culture? Because this is what's made us successful. And that indeed is the secret sauce of General Atlantic globally. No, that's very, uh, that's very humbling. Uh, lots of uh, learnings uh, for, for young investors like, like me. Um, I'm going to shift gears to Ashish uh, uh, a little bit uh, um, on, on the fragmentation that you face in uh, Southeast Asia. And actually, Sandeep can give a quick context. I, I, I understand that uh, you know, GA is looking to do more in Southeast Asia, but Southeast Asia is a bit different from India, uh, where, you know, well, you can argue that India is a more homogeneous market. Southeast Asia has ten countries, you know, ten languages, ten religion. You know, uh, uh, how how would how would your team uh, in uh, in Southeast Asia 
uh, navigate the different markets and how has your experience been uh, in the past few years and going forward? What are your plans for the future? Maybe Sandeep can, oh, you know, maybe kick the... Yeah, let me open it up as an yeah. hundred yeah. to uh, yep. Ashish and Skander. Yep, yep, yep. Um, we find Southeast Asia as an exceptionally attractive market, right? But Yinglang, when you put Southeast Asia together, the numbers start matching what India is. And outside in, you say, oh, wow, such an attractive, huge market. Let's go ahead and, and make some investments. When you arrive in Southeast Asia, you see that it is uh, actually a fragmented market. And every local market, every local regulator is very different. So you can't take a broad brush and say, this is a theme that has worked elsewhere. It will also work in Southeast Asia as an aggregation. You really need to go and understand the local nuances of those markets. And within that, we love Indonesia because of the, of the TAM that Indonesia provided. It's a large market. And the only way you play, play these markets and, and the only way we have been successful globally, you know, we have a very, very local Chinese team that Eric and Roger lead. We have a very local Indian team that I was leading. Uh, we have a very, very uh, local Latin American team that Martin leads. And so we hired Ashish and three other, two other individuals in Jakarta because you need that local nuance of Indonesia to really smell a deal and say which entrepreneurs you can back versus not, right? So, and I'll let Ashish uh, double click on that. Similarly, we have Iskander, who's from Malaysia. We have, uh, you know, we are, we are looking at expanding the team to get somebody from Vietnam who can help us penetrate that particular market. So that local nuance in the end is, 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 what, is what's going to make the difference. And in terms of our commitment, uh, I have personally rebased myself to Singapore just as of last week uh, because we really believe this is a huge opportunity and uh, I am here to drive that over the next few years and build out the team because of the opportunity set that we see. So I'll be spending much more time here and spending my time between India and Singapore, but spending a decent amount of time here to build that out. But why don't I hand it over to Ashish and, and Iskander to also develop it. So I agree with you, Sandeep. I think what you are highlighting, I think just to add on that, uh, all these markets are relationship-based markets as well. So if you want to get the best deals, and because the GA strategy is to start engaging with some of the best entrepreneurs early, you need to be on the ground. And that, that's, I would say that's very important. Historically, a lot of very few businesses in Southeast Asia have traveled across geographies. If you see, you can count in hand how many Southeast Asia businesses are there. I think you can count only in one, one hand maybe. So if, if I were to say, but I see that changing. I think it will change in the future. It's not going to be easy, but it's going to change. And one thing which is, or two things which I think would make it change is, one is technology. Uh, it's, it's a big disruptor. And second is that young generation of entrepreneurs. Because the previous generation of entrepreneurs were working closely with authorities, etc., and their business models were defined with different competencies. In the future, people are more enterprising. Their networks are broader. And they are able to develop those networks earlier on. So at this young age, it is easier to collaborate, I would say. So I, I see that changing. And we can see that with the examples of Shopee and uh, Grab already, Grab, Gojek, etc. But it's, it's difficult. I agree with you, Sandeep. Uh, it's difficult. It's not easy. But it will change. I think you know, the only couple of points I would add is I think we're very respectful of the nuance. And I think what that means is when we look at, at, at the 10 markets or so that make up Southeast Asia, we do make a call on how well do we know each one of these markets, and so how aggressive or how much do we want to lean in at this juncture as we still get smart. So I think um, that discipline towards getting to know these markets, I think, is very embedded within the firm. It's embedded not only in how we think about building the team, but also how we approach work. I think the second is, you know, obviously, you know, we can benefit a lot from global passion recognition, where we can call insights from different parts of the world. But I think taking a very um, structured approach to understanding what models work in particular markets, because I think it's too easy to say this worked in India or this worked in China, hence this will work in any country in Southeast Asia. Uh, and in some cases, you know, that means that what, you know, what we like in, in other bigger markets don't apply, but that there are particular models within some of these geographies that we like within Southeast Asia, which are unique to the country, but work, uh, but are not common to, to what we see in other parts of the world. And I think being respectful of that and, 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 and I think and, and being honest about understanding what that is and getting to that point, I think is it, really ingrained in what we're trying to do, uh, certainly in Southeast Asia. 
No, fantastic. Uh, I wanted to also highlight one of the interesting investments that GA has made. Uh, I just checked the stock price, and uh, C is now a $100 billion uh, company. Uh, and uh, I think GA as a very early investor had the foresight to, uh, to, to, to invest, I think, if I understand correctly, less than a billion valuation entry price. Uh, yes. So uh, Im immense, uh, immense prescient uh, to do that. Um, and I wanted to segue to sort of uh, exits that you see in, in either China, in India, Southeast Asia, and how you think about you know, generating the next $100 billion company in a portfolio. Um, Anyone in the team can take it. But yeah, Roger, if you can kick off for China and then I'll cover that. Yeah, yeah. Roger, why do, you, why do you talk about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, so uh, so as mentioned before, you know, we, we are huge believers in, in, in digitalization and uh, and the application in technology and fintech, right? So I think like we are actively so we, we are we are fortunately to have uh, become the leading investor in a couple of like uh, in, the, in a couple of like the leading uh, businesses in China, such as Ant Financial. Meituan and the Baidance, you know, in the mobile era. And now we are, we are actively exploring and looking forward to the next $100 billion opportunity uh, from the region. So I'm sure like uh, Sandy, like Ashish, we are, we are all in ready to, to provide the best support, the best global support to the next generation entrepreneurs and the business in the region. Yeah, so we're going to follow on our success uh, story, Zinglang. And um, as, I, as, 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 as I mentioned to you, Geo would be the next big you know, $100 billion plus dollar company coming out of India. Uh, Baiju uh, is raising money at about $12 billion today in, in a matter of just three to four years, right? I think if there was one big ed tech company coming out of India, you know, it would be Baiju and we're already early investors in Baiju. And similarly in Southeast Asia, we're identifying the next C for Southeast Asia, right? We are looking at the Indonesian markets, we're looking at Vietnamese, Vietnam market, and we are figuring out which is that next big play that's gonna come because these are still, we are still early in our innings in terms of the life cycle of some of these economies. And there will be companies with tens and billions of dollars of market cap coming out of it. And our secret sauce is to identify them early, to develop a strong relationship with these entrepreneurs early, mm -hmm. and then go take a bet and be with them for the long term. One yeah. of the good things about General Atlantic uh, is that we don't have a fund life. It's a, a, it's a pool of capital. And hence, we can stay invested significantly longer than typical private equity funds. And this is an important message for a lot of the entrepreneurs because we don't have to exit in four to five years, you know, because around that time, the capital markets might not be strong. The company might be going through a tough phase. So we never sit on the heads of our entrepreneurs to say we have to exit because we need to raise the next fund and we need to show some liquidity in the current fund. The flexibility of our capital allows us to hold our investments as long as or as short as we need to. And as a result, we are fully aligned with our entrepreneurs to decide what is the right time for us to independently exit or for us to exit along with the entrepreneurs. And that makes it a very differentiated pool of capital when you work with General Atlantic. No, fantastic. Uh, we have, I guess, time for one last question, which I... I, I noted down that I, I wanted to ask you this, which is uh, for younger companies, and, and you mentioned that you wanted to build a relationship way early before you invest. Uh, I understand you have an emerging growth program that's uh, very interesting. Uh, you know, maybe you can share a little bit about what that means for younger companies that aspires to be the next Baiju, C, or Joe, you know. Uh, uh, what? Yeah. Maybe... So, Yinglang, thanks for bringing that up because yeah. you know what we used to see as General Atlantic, just given our, our brand and our reach, was that we used to always get a lot of young companies reach out to us saying, hey, would you be interested in coming into the capital structure? And we used to look at those companies. We used to love what they were doing, but we used to say that our minimum check size is $75 million. So we used to refer them to our friends, uh, uh, you know, investor friends, to say, hey, I love this company. You should invest and we'll come into the next round. And that happened consistently many times over where our, our, our friendly investors invested with them. And within a year, brought those deals to us at three times the price, or five <laughs> times the price. And we said, wait a sec, we scratched our head and said, why are we doing this? You know, uh, If we can create a pool of capital that can back some of these companies that we know are solid entrepreneurs backing a great, so, uh, a great segment, we should have the flexibility to go slightly early and, and, and sit at the table and help them scale. And as they scale, we can then deploy more capital to eventually get the check size to where we want it to. So Baiju's, for instance, was an emerging growth company. Mm. We put about $60 million to start off with, and then we kept on adding to that position, and today we have close to $400 million in it. Right? Ruanguru is, again, 
uh, you know, sub $75 million kind of investment. There are a bunch of other companies in China that we have invested where we just got to put into the door and said, let's help scale this company. And now they have become a very large uh, investment for us, plus have significantly grown. So I would, I would want to leave this message behind that, you know, even if, it's, uh, even if entrepreneurs might think companies are slightly early for us, we would love to start that conversation, develop the relationship, and we can do deals uh, at $25 million plus. So even if, if the company is only raising about $25 million, that's still now right down the fairway for our emerging growth strategy at General Frank. Uh, on that note, I think we are, we're out of time, but uh, it's been a wonderful uh, experience uh, behind the scene with General Atlantic. And uh, thanks, uh, Sandeep, Roger, Ashish, and Iskandar for being so generous with your time and you know, showing us the inside secrets of GA. Uh, and I uh, look forward to you know, seeing GA being more active in the region and also you know, creating more $100 billion companies like C. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for this. <laughs> and, you know, uh, one of the one of the key criteria for us would be to to back one of your companies. Oh, or great! To invest with you. <laughs> Looking forward, forward to that. that. Looking forward to that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Some good insights there from General Atlantic and thank you Ying Lan for helping us get a clearer view of their inner workings and also what they're looking out for in this region. Yeah.